Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of the Mission Matters Podcast, your source for all things business. My name is Adam Torres, and if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Michael Follick on the line, and he's CEO over at Abacus Health Solutions. Michael, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Uh, so uh, I'm excited about today's topic. So we'll talk about um, Abacus Health Solutions. We, are, of course, are going to get into the study um, that was published recently um, for your company, which is it's pretty groundbreaking and it's exciting because we finally have some measurements that weren't necessarily always in place. So we'll talk about that, of course, mm -hmm. um, and, and also just healthcare in general. I mean, it's rare to get somebody on the line that's been working in the field as long as you have and that also has a really unique um, perspective on the angle, especially in healthcare from a healthcare provider side, um, from the patient side. I mean, you're really covering this from every single angle um, with what you were tackling. So I think maybe just to get us started, just a little bit of your background and, and really how you got started on this journey would be helpful. Sure. Well, uh, by profession, I am a PhD uh, clinical psychologist. And so our role and my focus over my career has always been the relationship between behavior, health, and illness. Mm -hmm. Not much mental illness, mental health that most clinical psychologists focus on, but mine has been the relationship between physical health and illness and behavior. Mm -hmm. And so when you say this, I, I want to build this further out. So um, when we think about the healthcare system in general and what, and what you're going after, or I should say what you're focusing on, um, right. give, give us a little bit more context into what that means. Sure, absolutely. Um, we have been, our mission, and it's been for quite some time, has been to show the relationship between behavior, health, and illness. So mm -hmm. In the early years, uh, we were focused on establishing that there is a relationship between behavior and disease. Mm -hmm. As medicine has gone through a major transformation, you know, in the in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, it was dealing it was a biological model. Yeah. It was dealing with in, in diseases, typhoid, uh, smallpox, diphtheria. These things all responded to a straight biological model, mm -hmm. and which means you can treat it with a single, usually a single. Uh, biological intervention. Mm -hmm. um, but as we started to extend the life expectancy for Americans, um, Americans started to develop chronic diseases like uh, heart disease, uh, lung disease, yeah. diabetes. And as these diseases became more prevalent, um, it, medicine needed to realize that it needs a broader model than a biological model. It needs to move to what's called a biopsychosocial model. Mm -hmm. So more factors influence a disease, both in terms of how it gets developed and in terms of how it gets managed. And so our mission has been to establish the relationship between behavior and disease, and then also the role that behavioral science plays in altering those behaviors that relate to either the development of disease or the management of disease. Today, most America is fairly familiar with the wellness movement. That really came from the early days where we showed the relationship between behavior like exercise, smoking, diet, those things, and disease like heart disease or diabetes. What, so, fits, under, what fits under the umbrella of, of, of behavioral science? Just to give, me, give us a feel for it. Well, there's two, two parts of it. I mean, the first part is establishing the relationship between behavior mm -hmm. and, and uh, disease. But the second part is the principles of behavioral science are how to basically uh, modify behaviors. Mm. Most people that have, are familiar with the two classic models, one is the, you know, the, uh, the Skinnerian model, which is more of a behavior change model, uh, incentives and rewards and things like that. And the other is a classical conditioning model, more like a Pavlovian model. Mm -hmm. And as behavioral scientists, we believe that what's most applicable is the Skinnerian type model, where if you, the basic principles of behavioral science are, you, you, just like you raise your kid, you train your dog, they're all principles of behavioral science. Your wife manages your behavior. That's all <laughs> behavior science. You, you, you monitor the behavior. You uh, give feedback on the behavior. And then you give incentives on the behavior. <laughs> and pretty much the world runs on those basic principles. No, I think that's a great, that's a great, uh, that's a great, great, um, great comparison. Everybody's watching this right now is like, oh, so now, now she, now she thinks she's a behavioral scientist. Great. 
Uh, yes, they are. <laughs> they have powerful reinforcers in the world at their disposal. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so I want to let, let's move a little bit further into how the behavioral we so we talked a little bit about the behavioral sciences, a little bit about the evolution, like how does this affect our systems overall? So like healthcare, like because this is all evolving. And as the science evolves, like the way that all the different pieces that are connected do too. So like, what are you seeing? Well, what happens is let's assume, I mean, first of all, let's focus on diabetes for a second, because diabetes is a very prevalent condition and it's very highly, particularly type two is highly related to obesity. So as the obesity epidemic in this country continues to spiral out of control, the occurrence of, of diabetes is going to continue high. And, but di and so you go to a doctor and a patient gets diabetes, they go to the doctor and the doctor says, okay, you have diabetes. Here's the I want you to take and here's the things I want you to do and there's a whole lot of things you have to do you have to you have to test all the time you have to ma match your dietary intake with your glucose levels it's a very complicated disease and the problem is later in life you're going to develop complications if you don't manage it early on so those delayed outcomes are tough because you're doing things today that you're not going to get some of the outcome on until later and that's tough so um so basically, in the case of diabetes, mm -hmm. you don't, the doctor says you have it and this is the medicine, but you also have to engage in these behaviors. And not everybody engages in the appropriate behaviors. In fact, probably less than 10% of diabetics, type 2 diabetics, wow. follow all the evidence-based standards of care as published by the American Diabetes Association. So these are specific behaviors that every, diabetes needs, every diabetic needs to follow, like biannual A1C, annual eye exam, annual foot exam, uh, blood lipid levels, I mean, lipid levels, um, urine proteins, these things need to be checked every year routinely. And you need to test regularly and you need to take your medication regularly. It's a complicated process. So it's yeah. the patient has to be engaged. And if they don't give zip at those behaviors, they're not going to have good health outcomes. Mm. And so, and, and, and just to be clear, so then this, what, what could be pretty treatable, let's just say, or prevented some of the bigger things that happen down the line, like if un left untreated, then when this does comes up, come up, like big things happen, right? Like that's when it's like life threatening or, you know, losing limbs or like other things that are really big. Am I right on that or? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, unmanaged diabetes can have serious consequences, uh, such as loss of eyesight, mm -hmm. loss sexual functioning, loss of limbs, all kinds of peripheral neuropathy. There's all kinds of consequences uh, mm -hmm. to diabetes. And <clears throat> diabetes causes dis tremendous amount of disability associated with it, but it also has a tremendous cost associated with it. Mm. So as those things, complications occur, the costs drive up. So diabetes is a category. If you look at a healthcare costs, let's assume you look at an employer's health plan, 20% of their spending is on diabetes related conditions. Wow. Even though diabetes is a frequency of occurrence is probably only about five or 6%. In some cases it's as high as 10, mm. but it's only five or 6% of the population accounts for 20% of the spend. Okay, so that's significant. Um, I want to switch it up a bit. So I want to get into Abacus Health Solutions and really how you're working to combat some of the things that we've been talking about so far. Absolutely. So as I indicated, our mission has been to show that behavior is important in our healthcare system. And we have hypothesized that if we increase patient engagement in the management of their condition, we're going to get better health outcomes and lower health care costs if we can increase patient engagement. And by increasing patient engagement, I'm talking about making sure they see their doctor regularly, making sure that they do all their steps, their annual biannual A1Cs, their annual eye exam, their annual foot mm -hmm. exam, all the steps that they need to follow, as well as their medication adherence. We're going to get better health outcomes for those individuals, mm -hmm. ultimately lower health care costs for the plans. Mm -hmm. And so we set out to create, configure a, um, a system. It's a technology platform where you, it's voluntary and individuals can voluntarily mm -hmm choose to participate. But if you join, we will monitor and give you feedback on the steps and the time that you have to complete within a certain time frame. Mm. And one of those additional steps is what's called a diabetes health action plan. You complete this telephonic interview where our, our diabetes nurses and our pharmacists 
basically help you create a plan for yourself to improve your diabetic condition as well as those steps. And if mm. you're in adherent to those steps, you, may, you follow those steps in every year, we basically give you an incentive card, a get out of jail free card, I call it, which means that when you go to the pharmacy, you hand them this card and you have no co-pays or any out-of-pocket expenses for your diabetic medications or supplies. Wow. So there's the reward, there's the incentive for good adherence and, and engagement. And what we have found both in case studies after case study, and now when we talk in a minute about the study, I'll elaborate with the study, we found that we can improve patient engagement significantly and we can actually um, improve health outcomes and lower health care costs. Mm, that's a big so, deal. It's a very big deal. It's a big deal. So we can lower it for the individual too because they have no out-of-pocket co-pays. Yeah. And the diabetic is probably going to spend uh, 80, some uh, over yeah. 100 a month out of their pocket. That's a big deal. What is the, um, uh, so, and I know this may vary, right? Depending on the, on the patient, depending on the, so not, not asking you to give me medical advice, of course, but yeah. um, what is like the user experience? So let's just say that I'm watching this right now. I'm thinking yep. about it and I'm like, oh, Abacus sounds like a really interesting company. Like I, I could, I could possibly use this. I've been, I've been trying and I've been maybe struggling on this path. And maybe this is something that I can use. Like, what does that user experience look like to, to be onboarded or however you, however we would board that process? properly. Absolutely. That's fine. Uh, actually, uh, we strive to make the user experience very helpful and very um, um, supportive. Mm -hmm. This is part of an employer-sponsored health plan, so we don't just take calls from individuals. Yeah. It's usually sponsored by an employer health plan, and we put it into the plan as a benefit to their members. So if their members are compliant with the program, they have no out-of-pocket costs for their diabetes. Mm -hmm. And we try to make sure that we support them and we use whatever medium they want. Uh, if they want to be supported telephonically, mm -hmm. they have call lines they can call into as well as we do outbound calls. We do text messaging, we do email, we do whatever the individual finds most comfortable for them. Mm -hmm. We do. And there is a whole staff of people that can support you outside of the doctor's office to make sure that you understand what you're supposed to do and understand the management of your diabetes mm -hmm. as well is follow through with the steps you need to take. So it tends to be a fairly easy experience and it yeah. frees the doctor up to prescribe whatever medications are best for you. Like some medications are only taken once a day, others are taken three times a day. So whatever whatever medications and, and, and plan works best, the doctor can prescribe it and you can set it up for you. Hmm. All right, Michael. So talking about the patient experience. So like, how does this affect the, the whole family unit? Because I know different family members may be affected by diabetes and maybe some aren't. Like, how does, how does that play into this? Great question. Um, in general, we found in this country that women tend to be the primary influencer of healthcare for a family. Hmm. <clears throat> They're the ones that actually influence the other members of the family to do what they got to do. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages Let's assume that the spouse of the, the, the woman is the employee and her, her spouse has diabetes. Mm -hmm. They oftentimes struggle to get them knowing what they need to do get, to get them to do it. Mm -hmm. In this instance, we provide a lot of support for that spouse in the sense that we help their husband follow through with the steps that he needs to follow yeah. through. So it ends up helping the family dynamics a lot because then the woman isn't the policeman, <laughs> you know, we help take some of that burden. No, that's awesome. It, it makes, it makes total sense too. When you say this, um, like uh, all that, it just, it just makes sense. Now they're not, they're not the bad guy, so to speak saying, Hey, you have to go do this. It's more like, okay, if we do this, then we don't have to pay our copay or X, Y, Z or anything else. So then it's not like, it's right. like, come on, let's do it. Exactly. And now we got money to buy Johnny's hockey skates or Beth's mm -hmm figure skates, you know, whatever the case may be. Totally. Now, there, there's also many uh, employers, so business owners, entrepreneurs, executives that watch this program. Uh, what's typically from the employer side a good fit? Is it like size of company? Is it revenue? Or is it like composition of plan? Like, and again, um, just high level, because I know, I know, I know um, healthcare plans can be pretty technical. Right. Um, no, that, that's for sure. But most of the time we work with self-funded health plans. So mm -hmm. it's employers that are not buying the insurance per se, they're buying an administrator, but they're paying for all the costs themselves. 
And that typically tends to be a relatively larger employer, you know, usually a thousand or more. Mm -hmm. If you, you get into concerns about privacy and protected health information, if you have too small of a health plan number and there's only a few diabetic. Mm -hmm. So, um, and we find a lot of unions uh, really like this because it enables them as they've had to give up um, ground on co-pays and deductibles, yeah. allows them a way to kind of give something, make sure their membership gets something for free if they follow through with the process. So they, they tend to like it a lot, but the employers, um, there's a real business case here. And the reason for this study was to document the business case in a statistically controlled context. Hmm. This, this can produce a significant ROI. In fact, we just had one customer where we just met with them and we saved them $8 million last year. <laughs> customer. But there's a real business case for this kind of thing. You're not just giving a benefit away for no reason. And that doesn't count. That's direct costs. That doesn't count the indirect costs associated right. with lost productivity and a lack of presenteeism. Let, let's go further down the line of the study, because this is a big deal. Okay. Just published. So behavior-based diabetes, <clears throat> um, or excuse me, behavior-based diabetes management. Um, so t tell us why this was such a groundbreaking study and why, in my opinion, it's setting a new, a new bar for, for this, this, this um, I guess, for making the case on it being a, a real, you know, bottom line, um, something that can affect the bottom line, as opposed to just being something that we want to do or we should do. Right. It's proven now. It's scientific, yeah. credible. Uh, basically what, and there's many years over the years, everybody claims that they can do change this and save employers money. I mean, employers are constantly barraged with people who are saying, I'm going to save you all this money. I'm going yeah. to save you all this money. And they never do. Um, and, and so people have become skeptical over the years. So you really look for proof. Now we did a number of case studies. So we had a number of case studies where we go in, work with an employer, set up the program and not everybody. And here's important how we evaluate it. This is an important not all diabetics join the program. We typically have about 40% on average of the diabetic population of an employer self-funded health plan who joins this, the program. Now that's higher than most anybody other programs get by far. For sure. Three to four times higher. But we then look at the total spend of the diabetic pool before our program is implemented mm. and the diabetic spend after it's implemented. And diabetes tends to have one of the most rapidly escalating cost curves among health conditions. So it, mm. it grows faster than health inflation every year. It grows faster than the norm on yeah. health inflation. And so we actually run the program and we take the total cost before and after. And we found that we actually reduced trends. We turned them down. We actually saved money. We not only some, some actually is directly less spending the year or two after we did it than before. That's wow. all good, but you go and promise an employer that and they say, well, how do I know that's not just a statistical anomaly? That's just not, you know, happenstance. Of course. And so we run multiple case studies and still they say, you know, how that isn't chance. It could be chance that you get 10 of those in a row. That could be chance. <laughs> you wait. Well, that's true. That's the way we look at medicine of too. Course. The way you get around that is you say, okay, show me a controlled scientific study. Mm. Typical controlled scientific study is one where you would randomly assign into group A or in group B or whatever you've got, and you do random assignment. It's hard to do that here because you can't just say you're going to get treated and you're not going to get treated. Yeah. So what we've done is a, the next best thing, which is called a match control group study. So we took eight years worth of data. There was a 14,000 diabetics. And we took the group that was treated and we found a matched control group for them. And they were matched very in a very elaborate and sophisticated way. Mm. On age, sex, demographic area, or zip code, they were matched on what's called Alex Hauser index, which is an, a, a severity index for their condition. They were matched on whether they were insulin using or non-insulin using. Very complex matching procedure. We ended up with 300 people that were matched. And when we compared the treated group that the, the, we're in the program to that match control group that wasn't, mm. we had very significant differences, all statistically significant. Mm -hmm. found that they had significantly more, the, the group and the people in the program had significantly more doctor's visits, mm -hmm. significantly higher medication use. They had a greater persistency of insulin use. They were 80% more likely to use their insulin. Wow. They, yeah, it, it was amazing. 80 is a big number of anything, a big any number. behavioral change. I don't care. <laughs> but particularly insulin use, you yeah. know, 
very important piece. They, they, had, they had many fewer gaps in care. They completed far more of the things they were supposed to do wow. every year than, than the others. Like they were 38% more likely to complete their um, annual uh, biannual A1Cs. Mm -hmm. So we found those to be true. We found actually they had better A1Cs, which is your marker of diabetic control. And the people, there was a 20% reduction in people who were out of control by the time they completed the program. Mm. More important thing from the employer, from a business case point of view, there was 38% fewer hospital admissions in the treated group than the control match control group. 38%, that's a big number. That translated to 20% less on a per member per month cost. Mm for the group. So we were able to show that those health improvements, which, which followed the theory that better engagement yields better health outcomes, you have better, better, more medication use, better health outcomes, mm -hmm. lower cost. That's the theory that everyone's been working on that worked in the quality arena. And we're able to show that that's true. If you focus on the right behaviors, you mm -hmm. have to right behaviors targeted and incentivized. So it's a big deal. And now it get, we just passed validation from the Validation Institute, which is a division of the World Congress, an arm of the World Congress, saying these people actually can produce what their marketing materials say they can produce. Wow. Well, uh, first off, congrats. This read, like hearing your story, uh, to me, it reads like a Malcolm Gladwell book. I'm sitting here like, what? <coughs> what? What's next? <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. And, and the study was just published in the American Journal of Managed Care. And if I can, we've been looking at managed care for years and CMS did a large study on managed care and should it be a, it been part of everything. There was really no scientific evidence that you could produce an approach to managed care mm -hmm. that money and produced health, better health outcomes. Most managed care is just nurse call lines and things like that where people get calls and prompts. This study shows that if you structure it properly using the principles of behavioral science, you can in fact get better health outcomes and lower cost. That's amazing. What is, what, what's been the feedback from just the community, like in, in large, whether it's the healthcare side, the patient side, the employer side? I mean, this is a, this is a big deal. Thank you. Most, most of the, um, the, the feedback that we're getting is very, very positive and very supportive. Um, you find initially people are skeptical. I think if I'm an executive in a health plan, executive of a health plan, they all go, everybody promises to save me the money and nobody can. Yeah. So I think we're going to see now a shift in the way we start even approaching our, our, our mm -hmm. approach in the sense that we're going to take less money up front and take more of the savings. So we actually are more linked to exactly your outcome and your performance. Mm. We're not just, you know, the, the financial risk isn't all the, based on the employer. So we're starting to migrate our models to be more uh, back-end based than front-end based for reimbursement. And, mm -hmm. and, uh, not many people have been able to do this kind of thing because most people don't have the staying power, the financial staying power to support research for that long. Well, fortunately, because of our background as former academicians, we were able to get some supplemental support from the feds to do uh, mm. SBIR research. And so, and then we had our own capital. So we weren't answering to anybody but ourselves. And our mission was to prove this to be true, no matter how much profit. This is awesome. It, it really is a great story. And so what is this? I mean, you said, for example, the um, the implications of um, uh, you, you mentioned earlier in the interview, maybe you save one employer, I think it was eight million dollars. So that's very significant for an employer, of course. What about like, let's talk about overall healthcare system as 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 we're just thinking about different models, different plans, and then what diabetes costs, for example, like what, what kind of implications do you see? Like if we're, if we're just dreaming for a moment, as this, as this catches fire, as this keeps on um, growing and as Abacus Health keeps on doing great work, I mean, what do you see? Well, I, that's a great question. And I think that we're going to see, hopefully, we're going to see more of a focus of plan designs, mm -hmm change to basically incentivize people to engage in the appropriate behaviors. Because actually right now, health plans have created kind of a disincentive mm -hmm. to fill your medicines because, you know, those are barriers. Yeah. You have pays and deductibles and everybody says, well, if they get skin in the game, then they'll be incentivized to do it. Well, the mm -hmm. problem is if you put too much skin in it, it's too much of a barrier. It starts competing with your, the financial demands of your family. Many people will put their financial demands of their kids 
ahead of their own health needs. Sure. That's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. And so I think we're going to need to see a shift in the way we do plan design, hopefully to become more behavior based. And, um, and then we'll have more targeted approaches to patient engagement uh, in the, for, in, for the appropriate behaviors. And, you know, a lot of people have been trying to say, well, let's just incentivize the docs to do this. Mm. They, docs can't make patients come back to their office. Yeah. <laughs> All my colleagues in primary care say, look, I can get about 50% of them in, the rest of them, I can't get them back. Yeah. So we're actually driving from the other side, driving the patient to the doctor that's going to be an important next shift that we're going to have to make in our the structure of our healthcare system. I, lo I love that you said that, by the way. Uh, so first off, for sure, hats off to the doctors out there. They're already busy to try to like, they're not, um, and, and, and not, no offense to the medical schools, but they're also not salespeople. Like they're not, no. they're not here to cold call you to get you back into the, uh, into the no. doctor's office. They gave you, they did their part of the deal. You have to go back in too. But that being said, the, I, I love what you're talking about, um, the behavior-based, um, the thinking about how that works into plan design, because in theory, like in a perfect world, that's how it would have always been, right? Like the idea right. is like, if, in, if we could, if we can get the, the want to do and to want to treat themselves and to want to be healthy, it's not saying nobody wants to be healthy, by the way, I'm not saying that, but if we can get the factors to align to create the right outcome of behavior that makes somebody right. healthier, that eases the burden on the healthcare system, um, that eases the burden even on the doctors, like the doctors yes. that say that they can get, yes. you know, 50% of their patients in there. They don't want to see, I mean, their heart's in this. They don't want to see, yes. they, they told they told their patient to do X, Y, Z. They didn't, unfortunately, they didn't see them in a year or so. And now when they come right. back in, maybe they're losing a foot or maybe they're losing like something worse, or maybe they're like, past the point of, of, of you just have to eat right or do X, Y, Z, whatever, whatever the diagnosis was, right? right. Um, right. Then they're past that point and now they have to treat something that's much more serious. Like the doctor's hearts are in this too and they wanna see the validation of the patients getting better. Um, so it just seems like heading down this direction is, is just good for all parties concerned. It is, and actually I've, we've had doctors write us letters and say, hey, thanks, I appreciate this program actually drives the patient to me and makes them bring in a plan for their health improvement that they, we review together. They mm -hmm. go, I love this, thank you very much. The other thing that inter this intersects with is not only supports the doctors, but it intersects with something called value-based plan design. Mm -hmm. People were promoting the value of pharmacy and that if you use pharmacy more um, systematically, you would get lower healthcare costs, you would avoid some hospitalizations. Well, what we've done is we've linked, we've made it strategic where you're not just giving medicine away, mm -hmm. giving the medicines that are needed away for the right behaviors. And that's mm -hmm. taken a value-based plan design approach to the next level. Uh, and just like we've done with managed care, you've taken it to the next level because you've made things, all the incentives are very specifically tied to behaviors and they're the behaviors, the evidence-based standards of care. And that's really what evidence-based um wanted to see happen. Can you give, can you give just to, just to put some meat around that, can you just give an example of, of, of one of these, um, of one of these, how the reward system works? And it could just be one, um, but just, just an example. From, from our approach, or are you talking? Yeah, you no, know, from, no, from your approach. So there, so you're rewarding the correct behavior with, with the correct. correct medicine. So can you just give an, us an example of what the correct behavior would look like? Absolutely. Uh, we're rewarding it with a, the avoidance of cost for the medication. So if you, the correct behaviors, or let's just say you take within a 12 month period, you have so much time to complete this. You have to do your diabetes health action plan. You have to have your doctor's visits. You have to have your biannual A1C, your annual exam. It's a whole list of steps. Yeah. To complete all those, you are rewarded with the incentives. Now, some incentives are just money, but most of the time they're copay waivers. Mm. And that's how you earn your copay waivers with those specific behaviors, because nobody's tracking the patient in the yeah. general health care. No one's tracking you to see if you're getting that stuff done, because typically you leave your doctor's office to go get an eye exam. And they don't know you got that eye exam. For sure. Or you're leaving to go see a podiatrist and they don't know whether you got that. Mm. And they only look in the labs and say, oh, gee, I need you to go get labs. They want all that stuff ahead of time at the right time. Precision medicine is what we have to have. And that means you got to get the right thing at the right time for the right person. Love it. 
So it's almost like you're almost almost like gamification, like you're making it into something where you have to hit the hit the hit this new level to earn this reward. Um, you have to do X, Y, Z, which is, everything's right. in your benefit. You're not telling right. anybody to do anything that's wrong. It is like gamification, but in a sense, you're not in a draw. You're actually getting yeah. the reward. You actually get you're assured you're assured the winning of the game if you do these steps. It's awesome. Um, so Michael, I just have to say it has been a pleasure having you on the show today. And you taught me a lot today about what's going on. And uh, I know my audience too learned a lot. Um, that being said, if somebody's watching this and they want to learn more, maybe, maybe they want to read the study or maybe they want to, they're an sure. employer looking at things. Um, I mean, what's the best way for people to connect with Advocacy Health Solutions overall? Uh, it's probably the easiest to go onto the website and reach out to us through the web portal. It, it's Abacus Health Solutions. AbacusHealth.com is what they go to. And so Fantastic. You, and we'll have all that in the show awesome. notes, of course, and, and all that good stuff. So uh, our viewers can go in there and just click on the link. So um, again, Michael, it's been a pleasure having you on the show My today. Pleasure. And, Pleasure's uh, all mine. And to the audience, as always, uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope you got a lot of value out of this. Hope you learned a lot. If you did, don't forget, hit that subscribe button. We definitely want you to be a return uh, listener or viewer, depending on where you're at with us today. And uh, Michael, until the next time, thanks again for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you.